Hello you guys and welcome to a new video. This week we are going to be doing the same thing we did a couple of weeks ago which is I'm going to be taking you along with my week in a dress history student life. <laughs> we are going to be entering week 10 next week. Um, so today is actually uh, Wednesday. I Last time I started out on Monday but I thought it'd be more interesting this time to start on Wednesday because Wednesday is actually the time I start prepping, doing all the readings and prep work for next week. So that's what we're going to be doing, except for tomorrow. Tomorrow is still this current week. I'm sorry, none of this makes sense, but my organisation for this <laughs> this MA has been tight. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. Mm. Anyway, so uh, if you haven't watched my previous video, I am doing the MA Emlet uh, Dress and Textile Histories degree at the University of Glasgow. This is an academic research based, well it's taught, it's a taught full-time degree in my case, uh, but this is a sort of academic research based degree. It doesn't involve any costume design, any making, any historical reenactment of any kind. It is mostly about research and what we can learn from the past and the clothes that people wore, basically. Uh, we are in the second semester, it is a one year degree, so we're nearly done, uh, week 10 of 11. And then I have the final assignments to do, and then the uh, summer semester will be completely dedicated to my dissertation. So the other thing that is really important to mention, in case you guys, uh, whoever was watching this, <laughs> didn't see the previous video, is that obviously during the pandemic, this has been an online only degree. <laughs> I did move to Glasgow for it. Uh, which was recommended, but we haven't been able to do much in person at all. We haven't had a single class in person. And working online is its own challenges. <laughs> in particular, since the most recent lockdown, which was at the end of December, the library hasn't been able to provide us with any books because you're not allowed to browse the shelves and they don't have a click and collect system. Uh, so we haven't been able to access any of the print books. I will say that they've worked really hard on developing their online collection. So there is a lot accessible online. And as an ex-librarian, that makes me very happy. The content of the degree has been really fascinating and I've been thoroughly enjoying it. Uh, so I thought I'd share that with you guys. So today is Wednesday and we are starting on the prep for the first module of the week, which is Bont, <laughs> which is the birth of modern fashion. Uh, this is particularly regarding the long 18th century. I think the actual official title dates it from 1650 to the 1800s, 1810s. I can't remember, but it's basically the long 18th century. And it's about the development of fashion. Uh, there's an argument there that fashion was developed in the 17th to 18th century. And it's a lot about manufacturing, uh, sort of the industrial, how the industrial revolution spurred on quick development, which instead sort of motivated the consumer culture. It's a bit more complicated than what I'm letting on, uh, but it's been really, really interesting. And so the topic for week 10 is called fashion influencers, which I thought was a great topic to talk about on YouTube. <laughs> I particularly hate the word influencer, but I mean, it's been around for centuries in one way or another. And so the structure for this week is actually a little bit different. Uh, we are, have been assigned into groups and we are doing some group work and then we're going to be doing a debate. But yeah, I just think it's a really interesting sort of research format. Uh, yeah, and the group I was given was the, uh, what's it called, Royals? Royals and Nobility, I guess, as fashion influencers. So I have some reading to do, so I'm just going to be doing that now, and then I'll give you a quick wrap up of my thoughts and the reading. And I think that'll be it for today, because I have other things to do. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, let me know if you have any thoughts down below about the format, uh, what you guys want to learn from this. I, I'm hoping to share as much knowledge as I can. Uh, because I've actually heard a lot of people in the comments saying they were considering this course or, you know, are really interested in doing something like this, but there's nothing available in their area. So I was hoping that by sharing this, you know, it kind of helps with that. And yeah, let's go do some reading.
Hey you guys, so it's been a couple of hours, I've finished my reading. One of the reasons I was really excited to be in this group for this debate um, is because it's actually quite relevant to my end of semester essay for this module, so I was kind of hoping to kill two birds with one stone, you know? <laughs> so the first reading I had to do was called, it was a chapter called The Queen in Fashion Victims, a, a book about fashion at Versailles in the 18th century. This was a really interesting chapter and I think it's definitely, um, <laughs> it's definitely relevant for my research but it will be very hard to help us in the debate using this research. <laughs> so this um, chapter sort of goes over the relationship between Marie Antoinette and Rose Bertin who was the, uh, was a marchand de mode which was sort of a, uh, not really a dressmaker but sort of a dressmaker but they were called milliners. Um, basically just like a maker of fashion, I guess is what, <laughs> maker of fashion. And she had a really close relationship with Marie Antoinette, which was quite unprecedented because of the, the differences in their social rank. It was really unusual for someone like that to be allowed at Versailles and, and to be introduced to the Queen. It was, the, in the reading it was described as a breach of rank. Um, but they became really close and uh, Marie Antoinette spent most of her like dress budget on Rose Bertin, though she had other Marchand de Mod. And so I think sort of the reading builds this up as Bertin being Marie Antoinette's vehicle for fashion. So sort of the thing that gets her interested in fashion and provides her with fashion. And sort of Marie Antoinette is more the model wearing these rather than the maker of fashion, if you get what I mean. So I don't think that's very helpful for her. Although I would say you could argue that because she is the model, she is the person that is seen, she is setting the fashion even if she is not making it. I think there is an important distinction to be made there before making fashion and popularizing fashion, which popularizing fashion is what I think we need to focus on. So actually, yeah, that might be a good one. That might still be usable. See, this is why I like doing this vlog because it helps me talking and speaking a lot and thinking, thinks, thinking things through. Okay, so that reading was really interesting. Yeah, they talked about sort of the queen changing her dress influence from being the court and to being more of a met metropolitan influence as she went to Paris quite often. So for those who don't, have never been or don't know, Versailles is a little bit out of Paris. Um, it's in Paris, but it's not in Paris. <laughs> so you sort of would have to try. It's, more, it's not something that is in the middle of Paris. Um, so you'd have to travel in and there are the descriptions from like, her ladies in waiting and stuff that says she went to Paris once a week or more often, three times a week sometimes. And that was from after 1773, 1773, what am I talking about? So yeah, but then of course they talked about how uh, Bertin, as Marie Antoinette grew more unpopular, so did Bertin and they saw her access to the Queen as a transgression and so she was a threat to the social order so she also fell out of fashion. But an interesting point they made is that Marie Antoinette's bills weren't bigger than like Duberry, who was the mistress of the previous king, Louis XV. So a lot of the commentary on Marie Antoinette's unpopularity has been hinged on her being extravagant and spending all this money. But her bills weren't unprecedented. They weren't bigger than the people before, but the people before were mistresses, not queens. There's some interesting dynamics there to explore. Anyway, the other readings were about the English court, which was a really big contrast. So it seems that the, the, up until recently, there's been a rhetoric that the English court was sort of irrelevant <laughs> because of the, you know, the regicide in the 17th century and all that mess. And some, some one of the hinging arguments is that Whitehall Palace burnt down at the turn of the century uh, I think it was 1698, and so from then on the court was fragmented between different palaces located in London, and that's a really interesting and different dynamic. So like you would live in a in a palace like St James's or something, but then sort of the royal events, sort of the levees and like drawing room stuff would be held somewhere else. So that's quite interesting. Uh, but also that Georgian courts were seen as insignificant or boring. <laughs> but um, there's been some arguments recently about them being relevant to create a national identity and really connecting the monarch to that national identity. So interesting. 
for short less relevant to my um, essay because I'm focusing on Marie Antoinette but still interesting to contra co contra um, contrast and compare to a different court and they also highlighted that particularly in the English court dress was a point of access to the court if you dressed well enough you'd probably be let through into the court not very far on far in so they the, they described this series of rooms as sort of filters so the first room would be the most accessible one but the further on you move the closer to the monarchs you would be and the more filtered out it would be you know only people of rank would really make it that far but uh, if you dressed well enough, that implicated wealth, and so like you'd probably be allowed in. But they also talked about it. Also talked about um, dress as a political statement at court. So investing in court dress was so expensive that it was seen as a move of loyalty to the monarch, and then by consequence, not investing was seen as a political statement, um, and also abstaining from court was seen as a political statement. Uh, really interesting, hopefully relevant for something else, not my essay, but still really interesting. And they also talked about the most significant events in royal birthdays, or one of the most significant and massive court events. So, I have a meeting tomorrow with my colleagues to discuss, my friends, to discuss these and to build our debate and arguments. Uh, so I'll check back in tomorrow to see what we've come up with. But I think there's some groundwork that we can be done here. And I think traditionally the court or, you know, the elite have been seen as setting fashion. So I think there's plenty of um, supporting academic writing for that. And yeah, fun, fun, fun. So I just finished my preventive conservation lecture, so I thought I would uh, talk you really briefly through what we learned. I did my reading yesterday, uh, so we usually have a few like essential articles to read for this lecture and they usually just sort of preparation, context, groundwork for what the lecture is going to be on about. Uh, and preventive conservation, I don't think I really went into it last time because it was one of the ones I had to miss. Uh, but preventive conservation is actually held by the textile conservation course um, and that's to do with the textile conservation center at the University of Glasgow and this is more about the practical side so textile conservation is very different from the sort of work that you would do in the dress and textile histories degree so the textile conservation has a lot more scientific stuff in it, from what I understand. And it's about the actual conservation work that goes into maintaining textiles. The preventive conservation course is about preventing <laughs> damage. Uh, so we talk a lot about sort of environmental factors, sort of relative humidity, temperature. Uh, there's like it's something called 12 risks or 12 um, like problems, one of them is this disassociation, which is sort of neglect from the collectors, um, from the curators. Uh, yeah, so every week has a different topic. Uh, the topic this week was actually called emergency planning. <laughs> so this covered man-made and natural disasters, things like fire, flooding, theft, you know, earthquakes, tsunamis, that kind of thing, depending on where you are geographically, your museum slash art gallery slash library will have different challenges. Thing. And then the lecture was uh, by someone who works at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. And the thing I've learned the most is that I hadn't realized how common these things are. I thought fire and flooding was quite rare. They're not. Lots of places have burned down, lots of places have been flooded, collections lost, like, she mentioned briefly the National Museum of Brazil burning down and losing something like 20 million objects. It's just astounding and um, yeah, so what was really highlighted is that uh, the priority of the plans is always to save lives. Uh, lives come before the collection and then there's lots of different aspects they have to consider. So what was really emphasised is that you need to know where you are because geographically you'll be more liable to certain 
risks than others. So for example, she mentioned that if you're in the north of the UK, you'll probably deal with flooding at one point or another, probably several times. <laughs> just knowing what your place requires and also knowing your collections. And then there was just a, a lot of stuff about basic administration that sometimes does get eaten up in sort of institutional systems. So things like keeping backups of your emergency plan, and making sure that it's not just one person who knows where these things are. Uh, you know, things like that. It was actually really complex, all the things you have to consider in an emergency. So there's this thing called a grab list. So in case of an emergency, there's a list of sort of artworks uh, or objects to prioritize in getting out. But there's lots of things to consider in that. For example, if they're in the case, would they actually be safer staying in the case than trying to waste your time getting this out? Uh, and also like things have sort of anti-theft devices on them which make them getting gain them off the wall much harder so is it actually you know realistic that you'd be able to save it in an emergency would you be able to carry it like is it too big for a person to carry it or are you endangering someone by making them stop and try to save this one uh, oversized object there's a lot a lot of things to consider i was kind of overwhelmed with doing it all and i think obviously if you've lived through an emergency it's, you'll probably have a bit more experience but i think i just freaking panic Oh my god and can you imagine just i think that weight of um possibly losing all the objects in this collection like losing that cultural heritage losing that knowledge i'm a hoarder like <laughs> oh my god it's just a bit overwhelming all of it really um and then we were giving we are um bro broken up into breakout rooms uh, into groups and we were given a scenario that we had to work through and the scenario we were given Oh Lord, um, it was quite long and it was a situation of a fire. And we were told these are actually things that have happened, probably not all together at the same time, but things that have happened in her in the speaker's uh, experience. And our fire was held at a, uh, a large national, uh, re a large regional museum. Uh, it, there was a new exhibition on, so it was very busy. There were school kids about, uh, there was, um, contractors in a closed gallery unsupervised, there were student volunteers in the store unsupervised, uh, the contractors were using sort of a, what was it called, a blowtorch or something, and they set something on fire, so obviously there was some uh, health and safety poor planning there, and uh, that fire then quickly spread and uh, the fire brigade showed up and no one had a copy of the plan, the person who was in charge of the emergency plan wasn't in, uh, no one had a copy of it, no one had a copy of the grab list, there were no floor plans, no one had like a, a timesheet or a list of how many people were actually in the store or in the building, so they weren't sure if they had evacuated everyone. Oh my god, it just kept getting worse the more you read, and it was quite overwhelming to think of all these things happening at, <laughs> happening at once. Like, the kids didn't know where to evacuate to, things were gonna get damaged for sure because there was no grab list, and yeah, it was just a lot. <laughs> but yeah, this is like, I'm really enjoying this course because it is presenting me with a lot of the practical things about being a curator in a museum. These are things that I probably wouldn't know about until I'd actually worked at one. Uh, so it's really, really good to get this knowledge and it's been really well organized. I really like the structure of it and I've been thoroughly enjoying it. Um, all of this emergency planning has now got me thinking, should I get an emergency plan from my flat? Like, probably. Oh my God, you guys. This is a hard topic. <laughs> I just had my meeting with my colleagues and it was exhilarating. It's so nice to have someone to talk about with these things. And we just spent like an hour discussing what is fashion and then getting muddled up between modern fashion and 18th century fashion and fashion influencers and what that might be, what that might look like. Um, really interesting. So uh, our plan for this is just to set down we were giving some prompt questions and we're just going to set down some arguments and some references for each of the questions and our points. I think by what I understand it's going to be more like a group discussion rather than a debate because there are quite a lot of different groups. It's quite a small group. Yeah, I just thought I'd take you through some of our points. So we were talking about one of the things that we've been exploring during this degree is the what they call the trickle down or the trickle up effect. So whether fashion trickles down from the uh, elite classes down to the middle and then working classes. And in the last few years, decades, there has, there has been some work in the field 
particularly I think by John Stiles arguing for the trickle-up effect, so instances where it is clear that it was the working classes and middle classes that influenced the elite. And that is something that came to mind when we were talking about this is that uh, maybe last semester I read an article about aprons and how aprons were popular as a sort of stylized item for the elite but obviously they weren't working so they didn't need aprons so that was a good example of something that the working classes were for practical purpose that was adapted for an, like ornamental purpose by the elite anyway that's not a point our point is that we are arguing that the uh the royals and the elites were fashion influencers in the 18th century so we've decided to focus on the french because we have several readings this semester about how in the 18th century, the French court was indeed the epicenter of fashion. Uh, it had previously been Italy, and then due to a lot of different reasons, you know, colonialism, manufacture, resources, it moved to France. And um, we're gonna hinge our argument there because I feel like that's the strongest foothold. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna be talking a bit about Marie Antoinette, and also the importance of being a public figure. So obviously the more people that look towards you, then the the more your platform is. <laughs> uh, Jesus. This, yeah, so our whole idea is that obviously the elite and the royals had a bigger platform than, you know, your neighbor, the Baker John, because not a lot of people were gonna go and see what Baker and John was wearing, but Marie Antoinette had all of her dresses reported in the papers, uh, reported between correspondence, like people would talk about her even outside of commercial print. So there's a lot there. Um, one of the questions is to the fine fashion. <laughs> we have been unable to do this, except that we've highlighted three important things for fashion in the 18th century, which is novelty, imitation, and the senses. So sort of aesthetically pleasing, taste is a whole different argument. Ugh, I find it all kind of a bit of a minefield to be honest. I don't have a made up mind on this and I think it's very very complex stuff. Uh, and then of course we are going to mention conspicuous consumption <laughs> because that is the hashtag most important thing in this degree so far, conspicuous consumption. And then we talked a bit about how they control or influence fashion or and if it was intentional. We talked about the for example, with Marie Antoinette, it's quite a difficult one because she she didn't make her own fashions. She had people who made fashions for her. And it's hard to know well, how far she was influenced by them, by what was available, what was being made, and how far she requested her own specific styles of dresses. Uh, there is some evidence of bits and bobs, but obviously this it's not like concrete. She always did this, she always did that kind of thing. So we want to bring in the relationship between the person who wears and by consequence popularizes the style and the person who makes it. Because but there's also been a good discussion of the influence of manufacturing and sellers and like people who, for example, uh, sometimes if like a drapers had a lot of uh, fabric left over that wouldn't sell, they would try to spin it as a fashion, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but we also talked about uh, the chicken and egg discussion. So are you following fashion or are you starting a fashion? And whether people can only really encourage what is already happening. If it isn't these famous people who wore it and made it famous, who did it? <laughs> who started it? I think the Shemit al is a good example because it was a fashion that already existed but before Marie Antoinette. It was worn by quite a few people but it wasn't hyper popular until there was all that controversy about her portrait and she wore it. Um, I've been working on my essay for this, so I've been reading a lot about it. Um, but yeah, I think what we're gonna focus on is the, the fact that uh, the elite and the royals had such, they had influence in general, whether it was fashion influence or not, just because they were talked about and they were in a position of power. Um, and we're going to talk about the importance of novelty and obviously novelty is expensive. So we're going to mention as well that by definition, the elite can only influence people with money because other people couldn't afford that, but they could try to, uh, there is evidence in the ancient century of the sort of 
uh, popularization of small luxuries. So like people couldn't afford a silk dress, but they would buy a silk handkerchief or a silk tie or something like that. And I think that by itself still displays an inkling to be influenced. So if they could, they would, but they can't. So they buy their silk handkerchief, if that makes any sense. Oh, hello there. Welcome. Let's take a minute to talk about our sponsors. Today's video is sponsored by Patreon. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to thank all of my patrons over on Patreon and a special shout out to Angela, Margaret, Alexa, Lourdes and Rhonda. Your support over on Patreon is what helps me make these videos as a, um, it's obvious by now I am a student. And yeah, just thank you very much. The link will be in the description box or up here if you want to check it out. I do exclusive Patreon only videos, uh, polls, extra photos of costumes, links to fabrics, that kind of thing. And yeah, we have fun over there. Back to business. Kidding, I'm not going anywhere. So today is Friday and today we are doing exclusively work placement work. I usually do my preparation for this a little bit earlier in the week, but this is a little bit different because the event that we've been gearing up to in this work placement has actually happened. So my task was to interview um, a textile, a really amazing textile historian, and that's not done. Uh, but my task now is to transcribe the interview and the interview was just under three hours and there's a lot of work for me to do in transcribing it. There's a lot of hours of head. I've done a bit, uh, but it is quite slow going. I, from what I estimate, it's taking me about an hour to do 15 minutes. <laughs> so I have a lot of work ahead. Thankfully, we don't need to have this done this week. Uh, we just have to prepare some thoughts about our interviews and things like that for the session in this afternoon. So I'm spending the morning working on actually transcribing the interview. I'm not going to show you guys that because it is quite, it's just me sort of listening to the recording and typing it out. So it's not the most thrilling um, activity to watch. Hello you guys. <laughs> it is Sunday. I didn't check in again on Friday because my meeting ended up being cancelled. There was some timetabling confusion. Today we have to focus on, we have a lot to do today. Well, I have a lot to do today. So I have to do all the prep for me, my applying module, which is on Tuesday. I need to revisit the preparation I did for BOMF, which is for the debate slash discussion. Uh, just organize that into some more thoughts because we've since received an email with the structure for the session. So that's that. And I also want to put in some essay work hours. So I'm hoping to do two hours of work. I actually already started on my so in case you missed my first video, I'll insert the link here again. It's quite long. I hope this one's a little shorter. <laughs> but uh, the way it works is with these modules, you have a mid-semester presentation, which is 20% of your grade. And then you have an end of semester essay, which is 80% of your grade. And this essay is 4,000 written words, <laughs> excluding bibliography. And the whole point of it is to, you pick your own topic. You don't have assigned questions. You pick your own topic that you're interested in, and then you sort of, uh, investigate it, uh, research it through the lens of the module. So in this case for BOMF, it is the birth of modern fashion. So it's how fashion was created, particularly in the 18th century. What is fashion is one of the big questions. And so we have to take those questions and apply it to like a spe more specific uh, situation, scenario. So my scenario is uh, Marie Antoinette, the chemise de la reine, and sort of uh, privacy versus public image in the 18th century, especially in this case for royalty. I find that really interesting. <laughs> I hope uh, the supervisor will too. And well, the marker. And for that, you kind of, it depends on how you like to do essays. I, I like to do an outline. So I sort of think about what are the most important topics, what will actually be the research. And then I put that into a structure, which is usually like introduction, Topic number one, topic number two, topic number three, conclusion, that kind of thing. And then I obviously start doing research. The first thing I do is try to find as many resources as I can. Articles, books, even websites sometimes, and particularly for dress history, you find objects. Objects and paintings are really important to have sort of that um, material culture perspective is really important in this. So I find all of that, I collate it, 
and then I slowly start working through it uh, and then I sort of I think working on your reading is really good because that's where most of your ideas can come from like things that you read that you don't agree with that's great challenge that write it down and sorry this isn't meant to be like an essay <laughs> how, to, how to write an essay but anyway that might be interesting to hear about my process so some people like to skip the introduction and come back to it at the end I like to do the introduction first because it sort of gets my brain going and sort of introduces me to the essay <laughs> and so I always I usually do the introduction first and then heavily edit it once the essay is done because often I know you're not meant to do this but often I'll write the essay without knowing what my argument or conclusion not not my, not my argument but I know my argument but I don't know my conclusion so <laughs> Like imagine you have a question which is a yes, no, or maybe question. I will start writing it not knowing whether it's gonna be a yes, no, or a maybe. And then by the end of it, I usually know. Uh, it is important to know what your argument is. And your argument doesn't necessarily need to be like an answer. So I think my argument is that, I'll have to tell you guys later. I need to like make it extra clear but anyway the part the the I've collected all of my well not all but a lot of resources for this topic and the really good thing is that the presentation for this was actually about the secondary literature that already exists for this topic so I've actually already had to do a lot of the reading for the mid semester presentation so that was really useful and that already gave me a lot of the ideas so yeah uh, so tonight in those two hours I would like to maybe read an extra article finish writing the introduction, maybe make a start on the next paragraph. Um, yeah, I, my deadline is still about two weeks or three weeks away. Yeah, three weeks away. So it's not too pressing, uh, but I like to do things early. <laughs> As you guys know, I have a bit of anxiety. So I prefer to have my essays, like I can't focus on anything else during those deadline times if I'm not working on the essays or I don't have them done. So what I like to do is try to get them done like three days before the deadline and then I'll revisit them and sort of edit. I'm, I'm allowed to edit them twice. That's it. No more. Because after that I'm like overthinking and overdoing it. So, uh, But yeah, that's the plan for today. It might be a little bit ambitious. I also have to do a lot of cleaning and I was hoping to go for a walk but Glasgow has yet again turned on me. So that might not be possible. I'm not one of those people who can enjoy a walk in the rain. Mm. No, thank you. Which makes living in Glasgow quite different. So, I just had I just finished my reading. Uh, this week's really interesting. <laughs> I explained a little bit more about applying dress and textile histories in the last video, but I'll do a quick run up. So this is a follow up module to a module we had last semester, which was. Do this in the other video, I forgot the name of it. Let's call it Exploring <laughs> Dress and Textile Histories. <laughs> and this module, uh, so that was sort of an introduction to dress and textile histories, like who the historians are, what have they argued, what are the big debates in the field, that kind of thing. And this one is about applying that knowledge and what you can do with it, basically. Like, what can you do with dress and textile histories? So, um, this week in particular is about period dramas. <laughs> so it's actually called Creating Realism in a Period Setting. And for this, it's really interesting because it's sort of the first time in the module, in the course, uh, that we've had watching to do rather than reading. So we had one chapter to read, two films to watch, and three trailers to watch. So we actually did a sort of a Netflix party with the whole like class to watch The Outlaw, Outlaw King couple of weeks ago and then the other film I have to watch is called The King which is also on Netflix I'm gonna to have to watch that later uh, I think they're both sort of medieval-ish uh, which is you know not my expertise <laughs> but uh, the other trailers that we had to watch was something called Fish Tank which I hadn't heard about a film called 71 and Suffragette I have watched Suffragette before and I really enjoyed it but anyway, the, other, the thing we had to read was a really good chapter and I don't think it's freely available online, but I will link a uh, link to the book in the description box because I really enjoyed reading it and I'm sure you guys would too, considering what we talk about on the channel here. So that chapter was called As Seen on Screen, Material Cultural Historical Accuracy and the Costume Drama. Ooh. 
Uh, so that was really good. Uh, so the person who wrote it is a like a film consultant, like what, a freelance historical consultant. So in case you don't know, I don't know much about this as either. I just have a general understanding. So when when period films slash dramas uh, are sort of in production stages, they call out to historical research researchers for opinions on you know like costumes, sets props like creating the period accuracy she does mention in the reading that they're usually only consulted about material culture not about characters or plot <laughs> so they're not worried about period accuracy there um, and the chapter goes into that a lot they talk about it talks about um material culture as the best way to express period in like film and that film will never be it talks the, the introduction is a bit about uh, film versus Britain word as an expression of history uh, but that's what she really highlights is that film is a representation of history rather than a reality because it's not contemporary so it will never be a reality um, but the issue really highlights that film is a superb way of translating material culture and there's a quote from another historian who says let the visual serve the visual which I thought was really good um, and then she uses the Duchess. So she was a historical consultant, advisor, researcher for the Duchess, which if you haven't seen, I highly recommend. I love that film. I think opulence is... <laughs> and the costumes, like, I have a soft spot for them. I, I'm not going to speak on historical accuracy because that's the point of the chapter. So she explains how the Duchess is a character-based narrative um, and they use sort of real estate homes to sort of present that realness. <laughs> Georgian realness. Category is... Georgian realness. Um, but she talks about how even though they used sort of Georgian homes, they all, they still tailored them to preconceptions. So she talks a bit about the private versus public and how they thought some of the rooms in the houses weren't good enough for the vision of the film, even though they were more or less accurate to the period. So she talks about how uh, modern preconceptions and conventions will always seep in Sometimes not a lot, sometimes a lot. Depends on the film and the production. Rented costumes. <laughs> so she talks about how a lot of effort was put into the main characters, but obviously when you're like clothing a large production, you have to outsource some of that, even just on budget uh, problems. So she mentions how the rented costumes are kind of a little bit of a downfall and feeding into preconceptions. So particularly, there was this anxiety in the 18th century about maids and servants having a little bit of extra cash flow and dressing like the rich people who were, you know, their bosses. Uh, but in these films, often the servants are portrayed as really like shabby and drabby and like not interesting clothes and like very like rough. While that wasn't true because there was an actual anxiety about the way that servants were dressing so well uh, that it was sort of threatening the social norm. So that's really interesting, I think, and it's a really good way to point it. And then she talks about how sometimes it's okay to manip like some um, some invention and manipulation of scenes is seen as permissible in inauthenticity because it is a character driven and it's supporting that character narrative. And then she presented a thing that I hadn't really considered, which was material inaccuracy as a highlight that the source for whatever you're watching is fiction. This seems really obvious once you start thinking about it, but I had never seen it that way. And I think if you see my video on Bridgerton, I stick by it. It is detrimental to women to show courses and tarot placing in that way. But it is sort of what that is trying to do is there's a sense that that's not real. Like the world of Bridgerton isn't real. Uh, highlighting it as fiction and I thought that was really interesting and I think that can be applied in a lot of different I think she was talking particularly about the White Queen uh, which is that show that's based on fiction like it's a historical fiction novel it's not like a biography or you know a documentary um, and that's something she really highlighted is that when we're approaching these things we have to think about the point of drama Dra drama is not meant to be a documentary and they use sort of historical accuracy or the feeling of material culture to create an environment and portray a representation, not a reality. So that was really interesting. 
uh, and I really enjoyed this chapter and I feel like it can really add to, I know like costume reviews and stuff is a big thing on YouTube and I'm all for them. <laughs> I kind of, I really enjoy, not necessarily like the bashing of people who make costumes because I don't think that's the point of them, but I do think they're a useful like teaching tool. Like you can learn why some like costume design decisions were made through an analyzing costume and sometimes why sort of historical things were compromised. I think that tells you a lot about production, character, plot as well. That was really interesting. So now what I'm going to do is there was also a podcast linked on here to read, read, watch, listen. So I'm going to do that. I have some pleating to fix on a skirt, so I'll be really well timed and I'll still have to watch The King, but that'll be applying done once I've done all those things. And then I'm going to focus on Bob. So, I just finished uh, listening to the podcast that I mentioned earlier. It was on History Now, I'll link it down below. And it was about the same topics as the, as the reading and discussion that I mentioned previously. But I've just realised that the, the academic who was featured, well, the researcher, consultant, uh, whatever the proper title is, <laughs> that was featured uh, in the um, podcast and the reading that I read, is actually a consultant on Bridgerton. <laughs> Um, ox. Uh, there, I still think that a representation of typelacing is detrimental to the history of women, but you know what? She probably didn't have a say in it. Anyway, the podcast was really, really interesting, and I'll link it down below for you guys if you want because it's freely available. And it was about. I think I saw a video about this recently about not nitpicking. So I like. I'm not on a high horse, I made a video complaining about a particular like anachronistic element or detrimental element in a um, period drama. <laughs> I, I don't regret it, but it, it is making me think about what we expect from period dramas. We don't expect actual history and that's okay, that's not the point, right? If you want actual history, you either read a book or you watch a documentary, that's what you're looking for. But they really highlighted how important the drama, the entertainment, is in a period drama. It's not a period drama without it. And yeah, you do have to sacrifice some history for it. They talked a lot about how like you have to make choices, you have to make decisions, and often you have to compromise certain things so that they translate rightly to the audience. That's true, absolutely. and. There was a really interesting discussion about language and trying to convey the otherness of history without having everyone speak like Anglo-Saxon kind of jam, you know? And they also talked about the struggle of, like, a film can have no footnotes. <laughs> you don't reference history here and there, you just rely on people either getting it or not. But also the opportunity to integrate something like footnotes. So, you know, when, like, um, a scene fades to black and you have, like, a quote on the screen about what happened or something. That can often be from like primary sources or something, which means that you integrate history directly into the film, which is really interesting. Yeah, they mentioned again the use of anachronisms to signal the fiction part, because obviously, even in period dramas, not everything is based on fact. There's lots of things we don't know. Uh, one of the examples was in The Duchess, for example, you don't have a lot of details about like what actually happened in those personal relationships. And so they use certain things that are created, they're fictional, uh, because they don't know, we just don't know. But a good way to signal that, signal that is just to use um, sort of anachronistic things. But yeah, anyway, the podcast was really good. I have to watch the film next. I'm kind of not excited about that because I watched The Art Looking and I also didn't enjoy it very much. I don't like, like medieval times were hard, man. Yeah, it just kind of depresses me and often all of these are about men swinging swords and killing each other and it's just like, mm, give it a rest, you know? Again, that's an important point in this is that often people turn to historical dramas for escapism, which I guess I'm guilty of. Um, but yeah, thanks for sticking this far. I keep telling myself I'm not going to ramble and then I ramble and then here we are. Hey guys, so we just had a debate. I forgot to check in before it, I'm sorry. But we had half an hour at the beginning of the session to talk to our groups and finalize our points. And then we each, each group had five minutes at the beginning to make like an opening statement. And then it was basically just sort of, um, we uh, counted up who, 
who everyone thought had the most influence over fashion in the 18th century. And then we all sort of kept the discussion going by challenging some points and furthering some. And I think we all sort of agreed at the end that there's not one sole group who was in control of fashion. It was sort of a circle, a connection of a lot of different groups of people, including merchants, non-elite, um, you know, dressmakers. Actually, I'll tell you what the groups were. So we had five groups. It was the royalty and the elite, the non-elite groups in Britain, colonial, imperial and international influences, dressmakers and tailors, and then designers, weavers and merchants. So I think in the end, we all sort of agreed that everyone had like some sort of influence. But um, when we were asked who we thought the most had the most influence, our group one, which was the royalty and elite. I think this is a really traditional discourse, uh, especially in 18th century, 18th century France, the court was looked up to a lot. Uh, but I definitely agree that there's influences everywhere and I think anyone with power and wealth and an audience could establish some sort of influence. That's what we came back to a lot was the importance of an audience and importance of spotlights and importance of being looked at. Um, because it doesn't really matter how fashionable you are if your reach is just as, like within your street. Like John the Baker uh, might have lots of influence in her street, but is that really being a fashion influencer? Like, do we have to consider the size of the audience? Um, and also, I think it's important to consider the purchasing power of the audience. Like, does can you influence without emulation? <laughs> it was a really interesting debate. Uh, I think these are really important questions and there's no right or wrong. That's something that was really highlighted. It's not black and white. You can't just say this one group influenced fashion, rule fashion completely because that's not a thing. You can't tell. It's history. But yeah, it was really, really interesting and I really enjoyed it. Uh, everyone had really excellent points. And yeah, we talked about that and we talked about how in the 18th century, there was sort of this rise of small luxuries. So like if you couldn't buy a whole silk dress, you could buy a silk handkerchief. You can buy like small things that sort of signified that inclination to emulate, but without being able to afford the full thing. Yeah, like we talked about novelty and whether does it really matter that if the trend is new? Because there's, there's, fashion is cyclical, I think. Um, and does it really matter whether it's a completely new trend or is the popularization of the trend the novelty? Ah, good questions. I think there's an argument for everyone. It was a really, really interesting session. Let me know down below. Who do you think is the 18th century fashion influencer? What is fashion? Let me know. This is the question that's been plaguing me this whole May is what the heck is fashion? Ugh. Oh, anyway, so that's it for today. Uh, I worked, oh, I forgot to tell you as well. I worked really hard on my essay last night. And I wrote about Marie Antoinette and the chemise la reine and yeah, all of that. But I'm not sure how much I can talk about this. This, this hasn't been marked. <laughs> um, yeah, T that's it for today. I think uh, I have to watch The King, the film for tomorrow. And I think that'll be it for the prep for tomorrow. And then I'll check in after the session tomorrow to see what we have learned. And I think I'll leave it at that, because this is probably already a really long vlog again. So, I totally accidentally lied. That wasn't the end of the day. So we had, oh God, my hair. Oh, we just had an uh, afternoon session. No, I can't do this. There we go. So we just had an afternoon session because there was meant to be a session earlier in this semester where we went to the library or the office or something and we actually did an object in focus session which is where we look at an object in the handling collection of the Glasgow textile collection. Now this session was cancelled because of lockdown but um, our tutor has very skillfully managed to arrange a session where she had the dress laid out in an office and then used like a um, a book scanner with a camera uh, which had actually a live feed. So we saw a roughly 1790s, 1780s Anglaise. Uh, it was this dark bottle green silk with bottle green, like a dark silk. Again, the camera computers, that might have been slightly different. And it was really cool because the silk had a slight difference in the warp and weft which made it seem like it had a small stripe 
It closed at the centre front uh, with overlapping bits and supposedly pins that has not been lost. Uh, the back was fitted, so on less, but it wasn't on Faro. Oh my god. The back was fitted, so it wasn't on Faro. There was definitely a waist seam there. Uh, there were box pleats throughout the skirt. It was open at the front, so obviously there's a, a petticoat missing that we don't have. Uh, there was a channel at the neckline for a drawstring to pull that neckline in. And there were also eyelets at the back into the lining and little channels sewn to insert boning, we think. Uh, the hem was impeccable. There were two ties hanging down from the bodice and little three little loops at the bottom of the hem to hitch up the skirts into a en retrousseau, maybe, or just to keep them clear of the streets. The hem was impeccable and very narrow. There was lots of piecing. <laughs> piecing is period throughout both the bodice and the skirt. Uh, some of the stitching was finer than other bits uh, and we couldn't quite tell what the stitch was on on the back bits but it looked like it might have been back stitch. I thought it might be the English stitch from like the elusive English stitch for a minute but I don't think so because the, the English stitch looks like whip stitches and those look like back stitches so. Uh, the bodice was interlined with a uh, sort of linen, possibly linen and cotton mix. And yeah, it was really, really useful and really nice to see like an 18th century dress. It was quite short-waisted, which points towards the later end of the century. Uh, it was in pretty impeccable condition, to be honest. It didn't look like it was worn very much. The sleeves were shaped at the elbow to fit into the arm and the sleeve seams were left raw, <laughs> which is something we like to see. It was like a one hour analysis and everyone pitched in and it was really, really nice. So, yeah. Oh my God, you guys. So I I told you that, uh, so I just had my applying session and I told you that um, this session we had to do a lot of viewing and I hadn't realized, I probably missed something really obvious, but I hadn't realized that this was going to be with the guest lecturer. Right, and the guest lecturer was Jane Pe Petrie. Petrie, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, but she's the costume designer for Outlaw King, The King, Suffragette, Fish Tank, 71, all the stuff that we were researching. This was freaking amazing. It was so nice to talk to someone with such experience. Um, I don't even know what to tell you because I'm just on a hype. But so uh, she started out by um, telling us a little bit about her career progress, how she got into costume design and she told us a lot about how she liked it and how she like uh, progressed from doing these sort of gritty urban dramas into period which was what she really really enjoyed but coincidentally she didn't like medieval. <laughs> it was a really really good a uh, really good session and she talked about a lot of the practicalities of actually being a costume designer so things like having to compromise on uh, some accuracy or you know she talks a lot about the balance between accuracy and cinema which which worked with the readings that I was doing a lot because that compromise is important because you're not making a documentary you're making a drama and it, it entertainment um, so she talked a lot about that and she talked a lot about the feel so she said she relied on her eye a lot so if she saw something together whether she would believe it's set in that time and if she didn't, then it wasn't good enough. <laughs> and then they would go back to the drawing board. Yeah, it was really, really fantastic just to hear her talk and ask questions. I asked a bunch of questions. I was just so curious about everything. I asked her, we were talking about historical underpinnings at some point and she said it was quite common. It was common or done, uh, not quite common. It was common and done to fit even the extras in a, a, like historical underpinnings. So I didn't really know how to tell you. I like had such a great time. I was just sort of, like absorbing all of it. It was such a good session. I'm so interested in all of this. And I think it really adds to my perception of, I think I got a little bit wrapped up in this idea of historical accuracy. But the point I think I mentioned in one of my videos before where I'm pretty like easygoing when it comes to period dramas, I don't look for historical accuracy, which is why I'm so easily pleased. <laughs> like if it has the look, if it feels like if I'm watching it and nothing goes, oh, that doesn't like feel right. Not to do with like historical knowledge but just in general with like the environment and the aesthetic like if there's nothing that jars you out of the moment then i think they've done a great job even if you know if they're using polyester taffeta or whatever like 
gotta do what you gotta do. But I thought it was really nice if you'd go into them looking out for the costumes because she talked about one of the difficulties with medieval is that there's so few sources for specific periods. Like you can get stuff from manuscripts, and manuscripts are spread across centuries and there's not a lot to go off of. So she did some really like um, amazing work into sort of imagining, so filling that those gaps with things that still looked or felt right. Uh, yeah, really cool. And on that point, I think we're going to wrap up here because I imagine this vlog is already hella long and we're, today's Tuesday, I don't know if I said that. But, I, well, not wrap up, I'm actually going to go into the university today. <gasps> I know, I haven't done that since last October, so I'm just going to drop off some books at the library and I might vlog a little bit. Not like of me talking because I'm way too awkward to do that, but I wanted to show you a little bit of the university buildings because they are stunning, stunning. And I haven't had the time to do any like in-place photo shoots. I know. <sighs> anyway, yes, uh, if I don't actually talk to you next, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this and I'll see you next week. <laughs>